threatened from slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land. And today I'd like to share with you some selected verses from Numbers, uh, chapters 13 and 14. Numbers, if you'll remember, is the, Hebrew, the book in Hebrew entitled In the Wilderness. It's a, the wilderness experience of the Hebrew people. And the passage I'm going to be reading to you is after they're in the wilderness preparing to go into the Promised Land, Moses sends spies to check out the territory. And our text begins at verse 1 in chapter 13. The Lord said to Moses, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I give to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a leader among them. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev yonder and go up into the hill country and see what the land is, and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there is wood in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. And they came to the valley of Eshel and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. They brought also some pomegranates and figs. At the end of the forties, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to touch the people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the people of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we had gone to spy it out, a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And we saw there the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night, And all the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why does the Lord bring us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, rent their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me, in spite of all the signs which I have have wrought among them? Here ends the reading. Let's pray. We pray, O Lord, that you would grant to us open minds and hearts to receive your word for us today. 
And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so the spies went into the promised land to spy it out and spent 40 days there. They came back, and it's interesting that the basic information that both the good report and the bad report contained, the basic information, the facts, were the same. This is a good land, and, number two, it has strong inhabitants. But what made all the difference was how these facts were interpreted by the two reports that were given to the people. First of all, the majority report, the negative report. Uh, they said, well, these folks are giants. They're Nephilim. Um, they're obstacles too great for us to overcome. Now, I, th I find it's interesting that they refer to them as the Nephilim. If you go back to Genesis chapter six, the Nephilim are supposed to be a race of people that are a result of human beings marrying the gods, the pagan gods. Now, the Hebrews aren't supposed to believe in pagan gods, but the spies who give a negative report um, imagine them to be somehow superhuman, an obstacle too great to overcome. And then they also say, not only are these people giants, we're grasshoppers. We're grasshoppers after all had God had done for them and through them they believe they can do it, they didn't even add God into their equation. Those who made this majority report, this negative report, remind me of the pessimistic individuals we all encounter and the characters that sometimes portray them. Do you remember in Winnie the Pooh there was a mule named Eeyore? He was always pessimistic. It'll never work. That's what this majority report was like. A belief that it could not succeed. They must have been from the accounting department and were trained to be cautious and prudent and cautious above all other virtues. Anyway, they brought a negative report. Contrasting with that negative report is a minority report that's very positive. Uh, Caleb and Joshua say this is a great place. It's a land going with milk and honey. In the first Bible I ever received as a gift, there was a picture of the spies bringing back the fruit from the promised land. And that one bunch of grapes was so huge that uh, two men with a pole between, on their shoulders carried it and it went all the way from their shoulders to the ground. It was an enormous uh, cluster of grapes. It's a great land. It's flowing with milk and honey. But the people believed the majority report. They believed the pessimistic report. And so at the end of the passage I read for you, there's kind of a footnote on God's anger toward them. Joshua says, do not rebel against the Lord. God says, how long will these people despise me? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done for them? We often face challenges in life, personal situations that are enormous hurdles, whether it's um, a challenge at work or in relationships or in our health or with our children. And as we think about those situations we encounter, those challenges we encounter, sometimes we're like the majority report that's pessimistic. All we see are the challenges. We don't look beyond the hurdle to the promised land. We sometimes behave like Good Friday people that forget about Easter and all that might be possible through God's power. You see, God's power is the difference here. There's a saying in AA, which I think applies here, Alcoholics Anonymous. It goes like this. Anyone who thinks he can stay sober on his own efforts is a fool. But anyone who thinks he can't stay sober with God's help is a bigger fool. All things are possible with God. We face many personal challenges and can either approach them boldly 
or with the pessimism of the majority report. Churches also face challenges. Um, we're at a time right now where I'm sure that you're beginning to scope out the challenges that lie ahead, what's in the future. When we ask ourselves, what is God calling us to do in this time forward, in this place, we see challenges. Uh, some of the hurdles and barriers uh, are pretty obvious to us. And many times, these giants that we see as barriers come to us with questions. Uh, just as there were questions for the Hebrew people in the wilderness, our questions are often questions about scarcity. Will there be enough? Will there be enough money to do what God is calling us to do? Well, I've got, I've got news for you. Um, God has provided enough money. The bad news is it's still in a lot of our pockets. There is always enough money. Uh, some people look at the challenge about people. Will there be enough people? Will there be enough children? I've said before in the pulpit that uh, Marge and I don't plan on having any more kids, and I know a number of you don't plan on having any more kids either, but I want to tell you there are plenty of children in our community that need to hear the gospel, that need to know that Jesus loves them, and the real challenge, the real hurdle is how do we connect with them, how do we embrace them and include them in our fellowship. God has provided enough people, enough children. And then there's that old problem, is there enough time? Well, you know, I've discovered that if I use my time wisely, there's always enough time. The problem is being a good steward, not only of our physical resources, but of our time resources as well. God gives us enough of what we need, not always what we want, but what we need. Why would, God create, uh, why would God create a mission for us and not give us the resources we need to accomplish it? You see, uh, the problem that church people have is the same problem the Hebrews had in the wilderness. Do they see themselves, do church people see themselves as grasshoppers facing problems or do we see ourselves as children of God? The minority report stresses the fact that we serve a God of history. We become a people who believe that God is at work establishing a kingdom and God asks his people to cooperate in that work. And before them lies the promised land. You know, Christians and our faith is informed by the past but we're always future-oriented. Christians are supposed to be forward-looking people, and so the golden age is always in the future. It's always in the age to come. It's not in the good old days, but in the age to come. In the future, will we look at our challenges and ourselves as grasshoppers or as children of God? I believe that because of the pessimism that sometimes is present in church communities, because of the pessimism, the fear, the caution, we often settle for too little. God wants to provide a banquet for us, and we simply are satisfied with crumbs that fall from the table. The big tasks that are ahead of us, this church and every church, can only be achieved with God's help. Remember what Jesus said in Mark 10, with human beings it's just not possible, but with God all things are possible. And the best judgment we can have when we are troubled by the challenges before us is to follow that simple command of Jesus, which is, follow me, follow me. In the coming days, you're going to be spying out of this congregation. Be bold. Pray about this every day. Pray that God leads this congregation in his intention for it. Pray that God leads each of us in doing his will and not our own. 
because we're not grasshoppers. God is with us. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are your people of faith. You've blessed us in the past. You hold out many possibilities for the future. Make us bold to move into the promised land, which is your future planned for us. Give us courage to see the resources which you've placed in our hands to accomplish your will and truly become your people. Bless us in all that we do.